All right, thank you so much, Beth. And thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, it's just amazing to be here at the summit and to see so many familiar faces. And Ray, thank you, sir. And thank you to PK. He's always helping out his fellows and we really, uh, we really love him. So, um, all right, so today I'm gonna be talking about um, IBIS and PAD. And it's a great topic. Um, it's something where the um, evidence base is developing and there's a growing clinical consensus um, that in the peripheral realm, IBIS can be a really useful tool um, in the same way that, you know, it's sort of already been proven um, to be critical in the coronary realm. I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. Um, and we'll start it out with a case. So this was one that we did uh, last year when I was a fellow with PK. Um, it was a 62-year-old gentleman, um, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and had really significant uh, claudication on both sides. Um, uh, that was quite limiting to him. Um, he had an ultrasound um, that, in addition to some uh, occlusive disease, also showed bilateral popliteal aneurysms, which complicates the picture a little bit, as we'll see. Um, he met with us, and he met with vascular surgery uh, at Mount Sinai, um, and ultimately the patient uh, refused uh, an open surgery and wanted to go an endovascular uh, route. Um, so we brought him to the lab, uh, and you'll see on the more affected side, the right side, um, uh, we start with our angiogram. So here's kind of the thigh and the upper leg. I mean, you can start to see kind of some aneurysmal development here in the mid-distal SFA, um, along with some occlusive disease. And then lower down close to the knee, Um, you really see the extent of this aneurysmal disease, which is pretty um, extensive. Um, uh, again, with a little bit of occlusive disease kind of um, in the middle there. And then finally, in the segment of the distal pop, you know, you see what hopefully is uh, some healthy tissue. Um, and so just, you know, looking at these angiograms and talking about the case, it brought up a lot of questions. So um, what are we going to use as our proximal reference diameter when we're choosing devices to treat this? Um, what are we going to use as a distal reference diameter? Um, with the associated occlusive disease, you know, what is the plaque morphology? Um, and then even within the aneurysms, you know, what's the extent of thrombus? Because these uh, popliteal aneurysms um, can have a lot of a very high thrombus burden, and a, and a lot of the morbidity associated with these is actually related to distal embolization. Um, so you always worry about thrombus in the aneurysm. Um, Additionally, you know, we were thinking up front that we'd probably need to stent um, here, um, just given the aneurysmal disease. Uh, but, you know, we wanted to know, is it possible to stent healthy to healthy, uh, which is what we normally like to do in the lab. And then once we do stent, you know, how, do we, how are we going to be able to confirm that we had a, a seal, um, given that we were most likely going to use a covered stent? Um, and so, you know, we were in the lab, we were talking about these questions, and, and we said, so how can we best answer these? And, um, you know, one answer that came up was, well, we can use IVIS to answer a lot of these questions. Um, so IVIS, as you all know, um, is a great technology. It was invented in the 1970s. Um, it consists basically of ultrasound producing crystals that are put at the end of an intravascular catheter. Um, it gives a cross-sectional view um, of the artery, as opposed to um, angiography, where you're just looking at it end on. And then when you incorporate um, a pullback, an IVIS pullback, um, you can generate that third dimension. So you actually end up getting information about all three dimensions of the artery, as opposed to an angiogram where you're really just looking at things end on. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, so this technology is, is well established in coronary labs. There's a lot of data um, related to um, outcomes with coronary interventions, um, but there's a little bit less in uh, peripheral arterial disease. Um, and so, you know, as we kind of mentioned, um, uh, IBIS is uh, better than angiography at some things. Um, so um, looking at the degree of stenosis, um, it's probably better than angiography. Plaque morphology, almost certainly. Um, identifying thrombus, uh, you know, that, that's easier to do with IBIS. Identifying a dissection, it's a bit of a toss-up, but probably easier with IBIS, especially if there's something subtle. Um, uh, on this table, you know, it, it, it says that really angiography is the only way to look at flow, and, and the nice thing about the you know, DSA angiogram is it gives you that element of time, and you can see how the blood is flowing. 
But we'll see with some of these IBIS catheters that we use, you know, you can incorporate Doppler and you actually do get a sense of what the flow is in a given lesion. Um, so, you know, it does actually provide a little bit of information about flow. Um, especially on the venous side, we're worried about extrinsic compression. IBIS is very good at identifying that as we'll get into. Um, and then stent apposition. Um, the coronary literature kind of tells us IBIS is probably better uh, than just, you know, eyeballing the, the angiogram at the end of the case uh, to see if your stent is opposed. Um, so when you're in the lab and you do IVIS, um, you can get, you know, basically any of these pictures. And, and this really highlights a lot of the things that IVIS can identify. So the top left in panel A here is a healthy artery. Um, and you can pretty distinctly see actually the three healthy layers of the artery. So this brighter um, inner layer is the very thin intimal layer. This nice dark homogenous layer is the muscular medial layer. And then this brighter and slightly more chaotic layer on the outside is the adventitia with all the fibrous tissue and, and collagen. Um, as you move into disease states, you see IVIS really gives you a great picture of a lot of different things. So this is kind of your classic fibrous plaque here. Um, so your intimal layer is thickened. And then here you have this um, echo bright uh, structure that's sitting on top of your media. And that's, uh, you know, that's your fibrous plaque right there um, that you, you can see is, you know, um, uh, pushing into the arterial lumen. Um, here is a more kind of heterogeneous lipid rich plaque. So you have this kind of fibrous layer on the top and then you have this more heterogeneous um, dark and bright um, plaque here. Um, that tells you that there's a lot of cholesterol uh, composition of that plaque. Um, so panel D you can see how uh, calcium looks. So it's a uh, very um, ultrasound bright, echo bright. Um, but you also look for the characteristic shadowing behind the, behind the artery. Um, on E, um, you, can't, you probably can't see it quite as well up here on the screen, but this is what uh, sort of um, somewhat organized thrombus would look like. So, you know, there's no fibrous outer layer. It's just sort of this slightly heterogeneous um, dark and, and bright thrombus um, that's sitting in, in, the, in the lumen. Um, and, and this, you know, might be kind of tough to really quantify on, on the angiogram uh, without the IVIS. Um, so F shows an intramural hematoma. So your lumen is actually here, and then you have this circumferential um, bleeding um, uh, between uh, sort of um, uh, going into the um, intimal and medial layer. Um, so G is a classic dissection, so you can kind of see here the beginning of, the, of a dissection flap um, extending into the lumen. So true lumen is here and false lumen here. Um, H is a malopose stent. Uh, and then I is actually um, uh, a previously placed stent with neointimal hyperplasia. Um, and, you know, you guys, when you're in the lab, you'll see kind of all these pictures. And, and you know, this isn't uh, really to commit any of this to memory, but just to show you that we get a uh, really good understanding of a lot of diverse processes that are going on um, in the artery that we really wouldn't get with angiogram. So it can be a great added benefit. Um, in the lab, at least at Sinai, um, we have a couple different catheters that we can use. These are the Phillips catheters. Um, there are a couple on the market. Um, in the peripheral space, um, uh, there are different catheters with different depths of, of imaging. Um, and so, the ones that we most commonly use in our um, arterial interventions are the 014 and the 018 compatible um, uh, uh, catheters, uh, which have a 24 and 20 millimeter uh, maximum imaging diameter. There is an 035 compatible that we tend to use in our venous cases. Um, that uses a sl slightly bigger sheath that we don't always like to, to put in an artery if we don't have to, um, but that can get you a lot more depth um, with, with good resolution at about uh, 60 millimeters of uh, imaging max. And then uh, there is one other catheter, um, and we won't go into depth about this, but that incorporates um, IVIS, um, but also allows you to um, do facilitated reentry. Uh, so it's basically an IVIS catheter uh, with a little wire lumen and, and a needle attached to it. Uh, it's called the Pioneer catheter. Um, that can be really useful when you're treating CTOs and need to re-enter from the subintimal space. Um, so I, I mentioned that you know this is a, a um, an area where there's a lot of emerging data, um, and uh, you know there's actually a trial that came out very recently, a randomized control trial that looked at IVIS use um, in in arterial disease um, that you know has kind of 
added to our, our, our data set uh, for the use of this technology. Um, on the Venus side, uh, it, the IVIS use is really well established. Um, IVIS is, is really the best way to identify extrin extrinsic uh, compression in the, um, in the iliofemoral region. Um, the video trial showed this that um, almost, uh, or, or, you know, 26% of patients who did not have compression identified on CT venography. Um, if you go in and look at that, uh, look at those patients on IVIS, they actually do have significant compression. So it's really the gold standard to identify, um, you know, Mayther or uh, physiology. Um, on the ar arterial side, I mentioned uh, the randomized control trial um, that was published uh, recently in Jack Interventions. Uh, um, it was 150 patients with uh, femoral popliteal interventions. Um, and it suggested a reduction in the rate of binary restenosis if you use IVIS versus no IVIS. And this was mostly patients who were undergoing um, atherectomy and VCB. Um, there are some retrospective studies um, that suggest that primary patency is higher with IVIS use uh, versus without, um, including one that Dr. Krishnan did um, that looked at um, uh, using IVIS when you're doing directional atherectomy. And IVIS was associated with a lower um, target lesion uh, restenosis um, uh, if you're doing directional atherectomy, then not using IVIS. Um, and again, more and more trials are coming out that are suggesting that, that IVIS could be useful. This is um, uh, an analysis that Dr. Krishnan recently published in JAK um, that looked at um, causes of DCB failure. Um, and, and one of the main causes was if there is a residual stenosis of, of 30%. Um, and in the conclusions, uh, Dr. Krishnan posited that you know, it might be tough to identify every patient with a, at least a 30% um, residual stenosis just on angiography alone. And so this might be a space where IVIS is useful. Um, so again, you know, this is kind of an emerging field and something that um, we're thinking is more and more useful. And that's reflected in this um, consensus document that um, everyone uh, that went to Viva um, in 2021 uh, came up with. Um, they pulled all the experts um, and basically uh, came up with um, the idea that IVIS is probably appropriate in almost everything that we do in the lab on the arterial and on the venous side. Um, it may be a little less useful um, in iliac interventions um, just because of the depth of field, um, but certainly in the tibials and in most femoropopliteal interventions, you know, IVIS really has something to add. Um, we talked about these additional specialized uses. You know, you can use IVIS to, to track uh, your wire path when you're doing CTOs to see how uh, subintimal you are, and that might change what your destination therapy is. Um, and uh, you can use it uh, with, you know, these specialized catheters like the, like the Pioneer to re-enter if you're in the subintimal sub space. Um, so to go back to our case, um, we uh, did an IVIS run. Uh, and we uh, defined our distal and proximal reference diameters. Um, so you'll see distally, um, we had a reference diameter of about six by six, and then proximally, it gets uh, you know, significantly bigger, um, almost a 7-0 vessel there. Um, and then we also used a, sort of a combination of IVIS and angiography to, to define our distal uh, landing zone and make sure that we had a healthy segment of artery to, to place our covered stent. And so we took our angio, we identified our likely landing zone, uh, you know, somewhere here right by the knee joint. And then we uh, dropped the IVIS down there and we used um, color IVIS to look at flow um, and to define the anatomy. And you see, you know, you know, right where we wanted to land our stent, this is actually a really nice, healthy um, piece of artery without any thrombus or dissection or, or really any plaque. Um, this is a very normal looking artery. Um, and so just kind of using um, IVIS catheter at, at, um, and angiographic landmarks, you know, we were able to place our, our Viabon stent exactly where we wanted it to, to be um, in a nice, healthy segment of artery um, and got a very nice final result. Um, so you see aneurysms are excluded and, and all the occlusive diseases treated there. Um, and so this hopefully should be a nice, durable result for the patient. Um, so the added value of IVIS to this case um, was kind of all of the above. Uh, it, it gave us a landing zone. Let us accurately size the Viabon. Um, we were able to seal, we were able to post dilate it um, to exactly the diameter that we knew the proximal vessel uh, was. Um, we were able to do an IVIS run um, after we deployed the stent and post dilated, make, make sure that it was well opposed. Um, and um, I didn't show these pictures, but um, the initial IVIS run um, you know, showed us that there was a little bit of thrombus in the aneurysms, but it wasn't too bad. Um, and so we could feel safe going ahead with, uh, you know, wiring and, and putting all our devices down there.
Um, so with that, I'll say thank you. And uh, if there are any questions, I guess we'll take them after all the speakers. Yeah, thanks so much.